Good evening. My name is David Quick. I'm the Adult Services Coordinator here at DC Public Library. I'm so, yay, everybody, yay. Um, I am so glad to welcome you here tonight and kick off another event and series with Lupita Aquino in our La Comunidad Reads series. This is such a wonderful partnership we have with Lupita. And tonight, another good friend of the library, Politics and Prose bookstore who, who are here tonight. I'm not gonna go on long, I'm just gonna say thank you to all of you and the DC Public Library Foundation who support these events with uh, speaker fees, but also copies of books to give away, um, including we have some uh, copies of books from previous La Comunidad Reads uh, events. So take a look at those, if there's any there, take one, if they're not, come back another time, see what's here. Um, I'm gonna hand it off to Elizabeth Rodriguez from Politics and Prose, she's gonna introduce Lupita tonight and uh, say a a few words on behalf of the bookstore. Thank you, everybody. Hey, thank you. Hello, and welcome to the MLK Memorial Library. We are so excited to present tonight's program in partnership with DCPL. My name's Elizabeth, and I'm a politics and prose book, um, bookseller, where we now host in-person and virtual events along with partnered and supported events, trips, and classes. Before we get started today, I'd like you to please silence your cell phones so as to not disrupt the event. When we get time for the opening of the floor to your questions, we'll be passing around a handheld mic. So please raise your hand and someone will bring the mic over to you. Please be sure to speak clearly into the microphone so we can all catch your questions in our recording of tonight's event. Following the Q&A, the authors will be signing copies of their books. So if, so if you have not purchased your copies, you may do so with one of our booksellers. So, now, without further ado, I'm very excited to welcome uh, Melissa Rivero, celebrating the release of Flores and Miss Paula, and Janine Capo Cruset. Um, say hello to my little friend. <laughs> Melissa Rivero is the author of The Affairs of the Falcons, which won the 2019 New American Voices Award and a 2020 International Latino Book Award. Born in Lima, Peru, and raised in Brooklyn, she is a graduate of NYU and Brooklyn Law School. She still lives in Brooklyn, New York City with her family today. We also have Janine Capo Cruset, um, the author of four books, including the novel Make Your Home Among Strangers, which won the International Latino Book Award and was cited as best book of the year by NBC Latino, The Guardian, and The Miami Herald. Her writing has appeared on PBS NewsHour, National Public Radio, and in publications such as The Atlantic, Conde Nast, Traveler, and others. She's worked as a professor of ethnic studies and of creative writing, as a college access counselor for One, for One Voice Scholars program, and as a sketch comedian, although not all at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> so Melissa Rivero and Janine Capocruset will be joined in conversation with Lupita Aquino. Please join me in welcoming them for another conversation with La Comunidad Reads. <laughs> Hi, can I, everybody hear me okay? I feel like this feels like a family reunion. Like I'm so appreciative of everybody that has come back from the beginning when the series started last year. Thank you so much for being here. 
I just also want to thank DCPL, the staff at DCPL. I want to thank Politics and Pros. There is so much that goes on behind the scenes to make stuff like this happen. It's wild. Um, so I just, I'm, I just want to open with gratitude for you guys' time, for the authors being here, traveling to us and being here. It just means so much to have you here with us. Truly, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and we're back. Yeah. I was like, we're back. Um, and I just feel like we're back, and this is the best way to kick it off. Um, two books that I just phenomenally loved, and I'm so excited to chat about them. We're going to do a quick little um, reading from each author, and then we'll jump into just conversations, and then you guys are open to ask questions. The big thing about this is I want it to just be like a big reunion, right? You're asking questions, you're thinking about the works, and we're engaging with these two artists, and I'm just so grateful to have everyone here. So let's start with you, Janine. Um, just to echo that gratitude, thank you all for being here. It's a Monday. That's, like, I would not be here on a Monday. I mean, I guess I am, because I'm here right now, but um, yeah, so just thank you for coming. Thanks to, to the library. Uh, thank you, Lupita, for thinking of us for this series and pairing us. I'm really excited about this evening, um, I'm just gonna read, Lupita just asked us to read like a little bit yeah. from the book, so I'm gonna read, I already Spoilers, just forgot taste. where, I'm just gonna read a little thing that, so the quick pitch for this book is that it's Scarface meets Moby Dick. Um, that's like a publicity thing, it's a little more than that, but it's also, um, it's also that. But I, I, those are two really weird things to try to mash up. So I thought I would just read a little section of the moment where our main character, Izzy, uh, his name is Ismael, which that's the Moby Dick part, right? Like, call me Ishmael, it's call me Ismael, right? Um, where he is seeing uh, the whale for the first time in his life, and it's in a flashback. So this is just a little part of that. So he's been in this stadium in front of this whale before, but he doesn't remember this. He was seven just barely off a raft and officially a first grader again, this time in English, a school year lost to the ocean. He was on a field trip customary to many Miami-Dade County students. He doesn't remember, but he walked around the park all day wishing for a sister. He thought maybe he already had one, but that she'd been left behind in Cuba. It could be true, this seven-year-old reasoned. Another mother, same father, something like this. Already at seven, he knew how fractured a family could be. A sister would mean he had a father back there too, someone he'd never known on or off the island. And of course, maybe a new mother, though he already thought of his tia Teresa as this. Ismael, some chaperone finally yells, and he's back, his face sticky with his sweat, salt, and the seas. This is the closest he's been to the ocean since being pulled from it months earlier. He is standing by a shallow pool brimming with stingrays all circling in the same direction. Signs he can't yet read encourage him to touch gently. The other children are arms in up to their elbows, but he'd taken one look at the pool and thought, pancakes. Then, no thanks. Words he never thought he'd know. Go stick your hand in the pool, Ismael, this same chaperone yells. He is still much better at Spanish than English and so misunderstands her. He steps to the pool's edge to do as he thinks he's been told, not wanting to get in trouble, his head just above its rim, then leans over the foot-thick wall, wiggling across it on his belly, obediently dipping in his head. The chaperone, of course, stops this, how many Miami kids would be dead if not for some classmate's overtaxed parent during some field trip slapping your hand away from a baby gator's mouth or prying your fingers from a parrot's beak? But not before the very tips of his hair soak through with ray water. He'd thought, my sister's down there, as a way to make himself do it. Somehow it felt more possible, less devastating, thinking sister instead of mother. And now that he's been stopped, he feels the loss of both, one imagined, one real, as something itching in his bones. The backs of his knees feel cold as his legs bend and unbend. He is flailing, screaming, the chaperone's arms around his waist, pulling him away and away as she thinks, what the fuck is wrong with this kid? His mother's name, Alina, though he'd never known her as that until she was gone. What is this imagined sister's name? 
If he could remember for her a name, that would convince him she was real. What was her name? What was her name? He heard someone near him scream it. Lolita! No, that wasn't it. But again, insisting, Lolita, Lolita. A girl to his left with a streak of snot snailing across her forearm has that forearm extended out, the hand at the end of it pointing. One of the smarter girls, she's in the advanced reading group and everything. A girl who can be trusted, whose report card states she has leadership skills, meaning maybe Lolita was it, if this girl says so. At school, snot or no snot, she tended to be right about things. With the pointing, she indicates a whole looming structure, Lolita's stadium, home to the killer whale and dolphin show, the tank in which they keep their captive orca. The first graders, even the smart girl, aren't aware that the adults responsible for them have been herding this, them in this direction all morning. The plan is to catch the early afternoon show and then unpack the bag lunches once a chaperone retrieves them from the bus, this poor chaperone missing Missing, the, sorry, missing Lolita's grand finale splash to head out to the parking lot. Lolita is a sister only to a few in a pod of whales thousands of miles away, but this classmate saying Lolita's name as an answer to Izzy's unspoken question lodges the name in his mind, a literal spot in his brain that remained dark and unbothered until just over a decade later when he peels off his sunglasses and the sun's glare flashes off Lolita's body and stuns him and lights it back up. I'll stop there. Uh, and now we're gonna have you do a little reading, Melissa. Sound good? Can you hear me? Oh yes, okay. <laughs> it's um, I just want to reiterate uh, what Janine said. I, we're so grateful to have you all here with us tonight. Thank you very much uh, for coming. So I'm just going to read uh, the first couple of pages of Flores and Miss Paula. The novel is about a mother and a daughter. It's been three years since um, the father and husband, who they loved very much, has passed away, and they uh, need to kind of figure out what they're going to do now that they find out that their lease is not gonna get renewed. Um, Flora's, the daughter's chapters are told in first person. Um, Miss Paula, her mother's chapters are told in second. And I'm just gonna read um, from the first chapter, which is told from Flora's perspective. I find the note under my father's urn on the morning that marks what would have been his 60th 63rd birthday. It has been rolled like a scroll and flattened under the weight of the wooden box that houses his ashes. The paper is white and unlined, its corners sharp enough to slice the skin on my hardened fingers. The ink is black and faded, but I recognize my mother's elongated loops descending towards the edge of the paper. Perdóname si te fallé. Recuerda que siempre te quise. My stomach drops. I reread the words, my thumb going over each one as I mouth them, just to make sure my eyes got them right. For nearly three years, my mother and I have tended to this altar and my father's urn, but this is the first time I've seen this note. My mother asking for forgiveness now when he is no longer here, it's almost appalling, except that she's not one to recognize her failings. She has never once acknowledged when she's wronged me, and I can only recall my father ever asking her for forgiveness. So what had she done that needed forgiving? And did it really take death for her to admit a wrong? Better late than never, I guess, but to do so here on this sacred space seems almost sacrilegious. When my father was alive, my mother had devoted this shelf in the living room to La Virgen de Fatima, her statue stood at the center, a pirate cluster glittered at her feet. My mother offered her fresh flowers weekly and water in the wine glass daily. Sometimes she burned Palo Santo from Peru or candles affixed with images of Christ that she bought at Sea Town. Occasionally, she held folded pieces of paper to her mouth and with her eyes shut tightly, whispered to or even kissed them before tucking them under the pyrite cluster. 
Prayers and petitions, I assumed. Spells, certainly. Confessions, perhaps. Maybe even desires. I always knew better than to look and never dared to ask. Now my father's urn is the altar's center. The items that were once at his bedside reside here too. His rosary with its silver cross and red glass beads. The bell he rang to call us over when his voice became small. Prayer cards for St. Jude and Sarita Colonia. His statue of San Martin and a seashell he had brought home from a beach long ago. His favorite picture, however, one of him, my mother, and my grandmother on a boat in Yarina Cocha is in my bedroom. My mother, superstitious as she is, forbade the image of any living person on an altar, especially her own. Over the last three years, new additions have appeared. An amethyst has joined the pyrite, so has a glass rose I found at the Salvation Army and which my mother insisted be kept in the hallway until she was able to cleanse it. Right now, there are the pink flowers which I bring my father regularly, especially on important days like today. He favored peonies for their rosy scents and fullness. It is spring. They are in bloom for only a little while longer. This period, the three months that stretch from his birthday to his death day is the heaviest of the year. My mother says it is because he comes around during this time. I say it is because the memories do. These days, I mostly tend to the altar, wiping the area with a mixture of my mother's Agua Florida and tepid New York City water. Growing up, she had filled our Brooklyn apartment with its smell, setting water in the glass jar on the fire escape whenever the full moon rose, waking up before the sun to make sure its light never touched it. Then she'd stuff the jar with orange and lemon peels, clove sticks, cloves, sticks of cinnamon, rum or vodka, whatever was cheaper, and let it sit until the next full moon, when she'd squeeze out the ochre extract, pour it into spray bottles and jars, and use the elixir to cleanse herself, us, our home. It's also what Ma used to wipe down this altar and all the bodies she cared for over the years. It's what I use on my father's body during the six weeks he was home from the hospital before death called. A kind of role reversal. How often had he rubbed an egg on my body as a child to take away susto or mal de ojo? But there was no escaping the unseen force that lingered during his final days. When I clean the altar now, I repeat the same ritual and prayer I whispered then, a version of what I had seen both my parents do whenever they needed a reset. I rubbed the the mixture behind my eyes to open them, press my fingers on the bone beneath my eyes that I may always see with clarity, and dab the spot between my nose and lips, inhaling the tang of orange peels and cloves, a reminder to breathe. But I never touched my father's urn, not until a moment ago when I replaced the old, the old doily it sits on with the new one my mother brought home from work. It's not unusual for my mother to leave notes under her crystals, often with a distinct offering, one red rose. Sometimes she'll even include incense or a splash of wine, too. There's a note now, visible under the pyrite. Once the saints have done their work, she takes the petition to the fire escape, where she burns it and scatters the remains. The single red rose is discarded, replaced with the bouquet and all the colors imaginable. But the petitions are always out in the open, never hidden, like this one. Had I not wiped the space clean and moved the urn itself, I might never have seen it. I read it again. Forgive me if I failed you. Remember that I always loved you. What does she mean by putting it under my father's remains? How long has this note been here? What is it she wants him to forgive even in death? I roll the piece of paper back up and tuck it under the urn, just as I found it. I wonder if she'll ever burn it. So I feel like you all read from the perfect parts of each of your novels, only because when I think of your novels, and I know that they visibly even look so different, right? We talked about this. You were like, they look so different. But there are so much, there's themes in there that you guys share and that you approach writing in such a unique way. And we're going to get into it. But I really want to start with just that launch pad. It seems like, you know, you have Izzy and his journey as a failed Pitbull impersonator, and then you have Paula and this note that she finds. So I'm curious about the inspiration. Where did it, where did it come from? 
for your novels? Where did it start? What was the, the little seed of thought? And um, we'll start with Janine. Yeah, that's interesting. I did notice that both books start with someone finding a note or getting a piece of paper. This one starts with the impetus for the action of the novel begins with is he receiving a cease and desist letter from Pitbull's legal team because he's like an unauthorized Pitbull impersonator and he mostly does it at like the mall. Um, and then he gets a letter and he can't do that anymore. So he decides, okay, time to go for my real life plan, which is Tony Montana. Um, but he tries to do it practically in Miami, which leads to like, there's not like parking, right? So it's hard to do deals when you can't find a spot to put your car. So it's like a little bit of a comedy of errors and it starts that way. Um, I would say this, the, it, it felt like, until that scene materialized, the one that I read, um, I didn't know how, I really just wanted to write about a whale. Um, you know, I think all writers have a fascination that we're like, oh, this is just for me, and I'm never going to share this with the world. Um, and for me, that was this sort of like borderline obsession with this, not whales in general, but like Lolita the orca who was held captive in the Miami Aquarium. Um, she died last October. Um, but up until that point, she was the marine mammal and longest in captivity ever. And I'd seen her as a child and always just sort of was like, un up until the pandemic, didn't really think a lot about what it would be like to be so isolated for so long when you're a creature or a being that needs family and communication. And um, so weirdly, the impetus for this is like the Izzy storyline sort of came about when um, my very first novel, my second book was on submission and I kept getting sort of the, the publishing industrial complex being like, we like the story, but it's not like the kind of Latinx story we, th we think we want that, or that we've seen before. It's a little like more aggressive. It's a little more, uh, I don't know. There was something that publishers kept pushing back on. And then I was like, oh, you want aggressive? I'm gonna give you Scarface. And I started writing it as a joke for myself. Um, and that started in 2013, and then like anything that begins from a place of spite, it sort of petered out uh, over time. And then I knew I, I was just writing about this whale for myself in my own weird places of like in journals and things like that, and knowing I could never figure out a way to put her in a book. And then when the pandemic hit and we were all in deep isolation in the beginning, something just sort of clicked about like how do you keep from going crazy? when you're all alone, because I began my pandemic experience completely alone um, in a house in the middle of Nebraska. Um, so I was like, wow, I really don't belong here, because I grew up in Miami. And I was like, you know who else doesn't belong where she is? Lolita the killer whale, who's from like the Pacific Northwest. And so they just sort of found each other uh, about like eight years apart from those two ideas before they came together. Um, so that's, yeah, it's the inspiration. That's amazing. It's weird. Um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's not fair. yeah, I did not come to this beginning until much later in the writing process. Um, I st the first scene that I wrote for this book was actually, uh, it's actually a scene that takes place like th almost towards the end of the novel. Um, and I, th that happened with my first book too. Um, I don't write linearly and I really envy people who can plot because I don't know how to do that. Um, and it really started to take root also in the pandemic. Like I was writing, well, I, the, the first thing that I wrote was actually like in a, in a, a short story class, um, Quayle's The Art of the Short Story class. And uh, I knew that this was a scene that was so charged that I wanted to explore it more. Um, and it was a Flores scene, the daughter. It was a scene uh, of her at her job. Um, and then I was, I was, so I figured, okay, this is going to be a story about this woman and like she's in her 30s and she's sort of trying to figure out what's going on in her life kind of thing. Um, but then as I was writing her scenes, like I kept hearing her mother and like I knew her mother was going to play a role in her, in the story, but I didn't realize she was going to be such a dominant voice in the story until I started writing more of Paula. Um, and then trying to figure out how she was going to come onto the page um, was really something that I uncovered just as I was writing it. But um, really, I started to go hard with the writing during the pandemic because it was the only thing that kept me sane. I was not alone, but I was in an apartment with two kids that I was, that was they were Zoom schooling. Um, I was working full time. I had a legal job at a at a, a, a startup, 
um, it was insane. And I lived in New York City where people, you know, we really did feel the pandemic there, like truly. Um, and so it was, uh, it, it was I, I needed something to anchor me because it, and this was it, you know, um, the, writing the story. Um, and I mostly wrote it in the 30 minutes between serving breakfast to my kids and them starting school. Um, and that's kind of how it came about. I, I mean, it's so interesting to also know that you both kind of started with this idea for the novels and writing it during the pandemic. Because I think a major theme that stands out from both, um, both of your novels is grief. Mm. You know, your characters are navigating grief from losing a parent or not having ever met a parent. And so I'm curious if you could just talk to us a little bit about those characters navigating that and um, how that just felt like being isolated and also kind of writing into that. Yeah, I probably should clarify in that the, just, I had the idea and the feelings, but the work of the writing for me did not happen weirdly until I was then pandemicing with my husband and stepdaughter, right? And then was like in that space. Um, and then it, has, it wasn't until we were able to move and actually have more space and have some distance from each other. And then I wrote it in like six and a half months, like all of it. But it was still, it was like 2021 yeah. was when I, so it was still, we were still isolating. We were still, you know, masking. Um, and I had moved from Nebraska to North Carolina. I was just like, uh, like sort of petrified with fear in Nebraska as much as it didn't feel immediate the way it did in big cities. Um, it was scarier in a different way in that in where I was, they declared the pandemic over in May of 2020, and uh, which is great for them, uh, but not for those of us that believed in science and uh, were waiting for a vaccine to feel safe. Um, so it was sort of a, a, that terror of like not trusting where where we were. Um, so I don't know, I, maybe you should answer this question first so that I can think of a lie. Um, <laughs> while you're t I don't know. I just, I, I just, re yeah. You, you answer first, and then I'll just sure. say this. I'll so. be like, ditto. <laughs> uh, so for me, I was really grieving, like not seeing my family. My yeah. mother uh -huh. literally lived down the block, and I just could not see her. She lives, you know, she's in her 60s. She lived with, um, and still lives with my grandmother, who is oh, wow. 104. Um, and she will put on her makeup to go to Dunkin' Donuts. I mean, she's just like that. She will, does not like a Facebook picture without her makeup either. She's so cute. Um, but we couldn't, I couldn't risk like, you know, their health. Um, and so I didn't see her and I, I mean, we all missed her. Um, I didn't see my, my, my siblings either. Um, I, I had a niece and a nephew during the pandemic that I didn't meet for months after they were born. Oh. Um, and so just being in that situation really, um, and then the sirens, and sadly, we you know we did lose friends um, and some family back in Peru. And so all of that uh, brought up my own, you know, grief that I had put away a long time ago. Um, and it just, it, it allowed me to explore some of these feelings that I was really, uh, that I had grappled with, but I, now that I had some distance, um, I was better able to incorporate them into a story where here we have these two women that are navigating grief very differently, right? The daughter, I mean, she's lost a parent who was really her compass in many ways. Um, and then we have, uh, you know, the wife who had really identified so much with being a wife and being a mother. Mm -hmm. Then now that her child didn't really need her and she was no longer someone's wife, she's trying to figure out who she truly is. Um, and I think in some ways, uh, both of them were mourning the people that they thought they were when this person was in their lives. It was so important and such, a, such an anchor for, for both of them as well. Yeah, okay, same. That was, I was like, that was a great answer. Um, no, feeling? I do, I will say I was too. like, do you want me to answer for you? Because I, I mean, you Izzy, can. Izzy's I mean, like, no, I'm just kidding. I mean, I Izzy's think my heart is, though. I think, I think in it, it, in this book, the grief is um, so layered. Can it, I say that? It's, it's so okay. Layered. Yeah, it is. Um, I think it's also something that even the character himself is trying to avoid, and that the narration, in some ways, is also trying to subsume with humor, right? Um, but you should know that if something is very funny, it's about to get real sad, like 
that's a, I, I'm of the ilk of the writers that like make like take you up the cliff of laughter so that the fall is even harder. Um, I think for me, the grief that I was feeling as I was writing the book was about uh, the city of Miami and just our climate crisis and seeing, you know, I didn't, the last time I was in Miami was prior to, you know, the last year or so was December of 2019. I was there for the holidays. Then we quickly went, when we went into lockdown, I was, I was not going to be able to get back to the place I'd always thought of as home. And it was also kind of a similar environment where I was like, that doesn't feel like a safe place. And I was trying to get my parents to drive to Nebraska, but they were watching the, the wrong news. And so they felt like there was nothing to really be worried about. And just already sort of like a pre-grief for, um, you know, the city I grew up in changing so much, but also that it will be underwater in my lifetime. And so I know part of my mission with this book or my hope for it was to, and this is the, the Moby Dick part in some ways, is like Moby Dick is this like elegy and archive and this goodbye to the whaling industry, which is like good, okay, that was really a bad thing that we did as a species to this other species. Um, I, but I, that same impetus of like saying goodbye to Miami or saying like trying to get everything I've ever thought about a place in one place um, with the idea that like a hundred years from now and people are like what was that like down there and they'll read this book and be like oh this is one version of it right this is one it's like an archive um, or a, a I don't know so in that way it tries to be like Moby Dick as well um, but that grief of mourning a place being gone and you know I, when trying to figure out like what to read I was like oh there's so many like just little because it also it's like borrows from Moby Dick and that it has these expository chapters after chapters of in, a lot of plot, right? So that you can just be like, these are all the birds of Miami Dade County, right? But then I make them all up because I don't know anything about birds and I'm trying to like not really be, I mean, it, it, there's really like an ibis, that's a real bird. Yeah. Uh, but I just wrote, I got like a guidebook about birds to try to write about them and then I just ended up like quoting the guidebook a lot. So then I started making fun of the guidebook or the narrator does, I guess I should say. The narrator starts making fun of the guidebook. So it gets very convoluted, but I, I'm somebody who tries, as a human being, whenever there's grief, I have to like, I feel like grief and, and humor sit next to each other and that um, laughter is a kind of like rupture in the body that is preparing us for death. And so that is why, I, that's, that's sort of my way in through it, is thinking, how do you laugh at something that otherwise you will cry at? Yeah, no, absolutely. I feel like that's so valid. And I mean, also something that I do, like humor yeah. for me is my deflection because mm -hmm. feelings are hard. Yes. <laughs> Which I feel like <laughs> is real and normal. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I wanted to ask a question, not a boring research question, but like a more so like, what's the weirdest thing that you ended up Googling for Ooh, your novel? And I'm asking question. this because so many good things. Seriously, in both. Like, so before this, I decided I was going to come up with a little playlist. And the pit bull had to be on the playlist. And then there's Bad Bunny references because Melissa and I are Bad Bunny fans. Although questionable, right? Questionable. Sometimes. Sometimes. <laughs> so, again, I'm just curious. What's, the, what's like the weirdest thing you Googled? Other than, obviously, the having the bird book. <laughs> yeah, I think the various facts about how the orca brain works and orca communication, there was a lot of that. Um, there were so many strange facts that there is a chapter in the book called Does the Whale Diminish? I should say some of the chapter titles are taken from Moby Dick, that's one. Some of the chapter titles are lyrics from Pitbull songs and some of them are made up and you get to just depict your own adventure. You get to, it's like a quiz you can give yourself in the book, it's like can you identify like out of the dozens of chapters. Um, but there's one, Does the Whale Diminish? It just talks about all the research that's gone. They're all like little small things about like whales in captivity and how their brains uh, change and some of the things they do to cope with the stress of it. Uh, the other weird thing you said, in, because you mentioned Google and like YouTube and those kinds of like spaces is uh, in fact checking some of the, there's a chapter that takes place at the Miami-Dade County Youth Fair. and. Um, there is a ride, rides apparently change names sometimes at this fair, and so I had to double check. But there's like no way to find that except to go to YouTube and watch people's videos of them walking around the youth fair, and then you hoping you see the ride behind them. So I had to watch hours of footage of people at the 2017, because that's the year the book takes place, the 2017 Day County Youth Fair to try to find out was the name of a ride, Whitewater Ride, like was it, was it Niagara Falls or was it Whitewater? Which one was, because it switched at some point, either in 2016, 17, or 18. 
And so I just was watching people named like Yadi Set walking around with their video, being like, oh my God, and I'm here at the fair. And you like are looking in the background to try to see it, the ride. That was very time consuming. Uh, how about you, Melissa? <laughs> um, I think probably one of the strangest things I had to Google are like fish. Um, yeah, I, so Flores works at, uh, at a startup. It's an aquarium and accessories startup. So um, you can order exotic fish on, her, on the app or fancy aquariums. Um, but I didn't know anything about fish except betta fish, because that's what we have at home um, that we have successfully kept alive. Um, I know. And so they don't die. They, no. Mine don't they, die. Mine, mine are three to four years. It's like, yeah. Um, and so I had to, I had to do some, some Googling to figure out what kind of fish I could throw in there. Um, and aside from that, like, I, yes, I do love Bad Bunny. And when I was writing a lot of this, like, Bad Bunny kept me going, and I was like, man, like, this song, I wish we could just go to the club and, like, perreo, you know, like, to this song. But then, yeah, like, when he started hooking up with somebody, I was like, ugh, I'm so disappointed. <laughs> I don't understand this. Yeah, this is what is going on. Um, and so I was actually towards the end of, like, edits at this point with the novel, and I was like, I need to scale back the Bad Bunny a little bit because I'm really feeling this, probably this, like, deception almost a little bit the morning the yeah heartache. yeah a little bit so I was like all right who else do I love Nikki Jam so, so um I googled uh and started doing some figuring out what kind of when Nikki Jam songs were like popular when when the story happens so yeah that, I mean that's a, I'm sure there's other stuff but that's what I can think of yeah. just off the top of my no, head no that's great so we are gonna I do want to leave some time for you all to ask questions so start getting ready I just kind of have a last question. I know this went by so fast, I feel like. Yeah, it really did. It really did. I mean, I just feel like, no, we didn't. We're just having, I feel okay. like we're having a good time. This is why I liked, I wanted to pair you guys, because I feel like you guys are a good time. Um, but now I'm talking too much. Uh, no, no such thing. <laughs> and I'm going to laugh the whole time now. I don't know why. Because um, I'm seeing you and we're thinking about you're grieving about, that yeah, it's over. I, I, well, that's actually, that's, that's, a, that's <laughs> what I was thinking about. And the distance from the pandemic and, and seeing that, and the idea that you had about how really history is not behind us. History is happening and we're writing into it, right? And so as Latinas getting pushback in industry, trying to write into our history, like how do you, how do you deal with that? How, do you, how does that, how do you deal with it? Like how do you navigate it? I, I don't, <laughs> what, not well. Um. Yeah, do you, you go answer first? I don't know. <laughs> I, I mean, I know we're different, like, sort of places in our career, too. And I think by, with my second book, I was very much like, I'm just going to push as hard as I can. And then by the time the fourth one comes out, I'm like, the book is the point. And um, it's going to find its readers. It is a spell. Um, I will say, too, this is a book that sold twice. It sold to a different publisher um, on proposal. And then when I got the feedback from that editor. Uh, and since I know this is being recorded, the way I'll say it is that like, that was, it was absolutely inappropriate feedback for the book. And my agent got me out of that contract within 24 hours. And then we went back out and sold the book to an editor who was willing to, not willing, but like excited about uh, the vision of this book and the, the way that it, as even a book, there's a whole chapter um, that is, again, because of the structure that I've sort of picked, there's a chapter where uh, the narrator is pushing back against a, either a reader or an editor and even saying like, the, they're like, but these are the things you need to have in this book for it to count. And then they're like, but this is why what you're saying is ridiculous. There's like this back and forth with another voice that enters the book. Uh, and the editor that, his name's Tim O'Connell, he's a fantastic editor. Uh, he really saw the vision for this book. Um, and he, you know, he was like, this needs to be bigger. This needs to be, you don't be afraid here. Like, I'm going to stand behind you. I'm not going to tell you to cut this chapter. I'm not going to be hurt. And I was like, oh, I'm not, I wasn't like worried about hurting him, but I was worried about like making him angry. Right. Um, and so he responded to that with enthusiasm and was like, this is a book that needs to be out. Um, you know, so that's how I push back. It goes right back into the work. It goes right back into the next thing on the horizon. Yeah. How, do you, do you want to? I think what is very hard for, um, what has been hard for me as a writer is, pub is publishing in, in many ways. Um, and I have a great team um, at Echo, 
But it's more that, you know, it, it, publishing at the end of the day is a business. Um, and a lot of your success is really determined by your sales numbers. Um, and the reality is that the, you know, it, how much you get compensated and whether or not you get the contract is going to be based a lot on your track record. Um, and so how do we write into our cultures and our history and preserving that? I mean, we can write about it. It doesn't necessarily mean that the publishing industry is going to publish it. Um, and that, that can make it very hard at times to, frankly, like to, to justify how one does it. If, for me, at least, I struggle with that. Mm. Um, because there's also, obviously, the financial aspect of it, right? Like, how can you continue to do this work when you also have to maintain some sort of full-time job to make it happen, right? It's not like they're cutting, you know, huge checks necessarily to folks, uh, to, to Latin authors. Um, and so you see that others are getting those checks and so they do have the ability to write and, and continue producing work. Um, and so I try to, every once in a while, I will get someone send me a very nice note to say that they were touched by my work or it impacted them in some way. And that is motivating yeah. for me. Um, but I will say it is, it, is, it is hard. It's hard to keep that motivation. And for better or for worse, like, you know, it, I, I, know I have two kids who I feel like I need to show them that they can be artists. They can do work that they love. Art is important. Um, and when they tell me, Mama, are you working on another book? And I say, yes, I have like a few pages written. They'll be like, why only a few? <laughs> Where's the rest? You know, and it's like that account. I, I feel like, okay, so I have someone that I really, it's holding me accountable. And if anything, I'm showing at least my two kids, like, the value of art and the importance of doing something that you love. And, I mean, I feel like it's so important to have those two takes, though, because I know we have writers and uh, you know, future authors in the room, and to know that that's going to happen and you have to keep fighting for your work because you believe in it and you know that there's somebody out there for it because we're here we're all here we're all here for both of you and your work so thank you for writing and thank you for pushing and thank you for continuing well, and thank you deal. for helping to get our work out there and find its readers it means a lot so. um we do have time for audience questions um and we do have someone that will pass around the mic if yeah. Hi, this is a question for Janine. Um, so, first of all, thank you for making me watch Scarface. I didn't think oh, that. Oh, no, I mean, the like, point <laughs> of the, no, you know, I, tried to, I did try to write a book that you do not need to have seen Scarface to get the book, but I was like trying to make people hate it enough to not ever kinda, watch it. I kind of felt compelled. I was like, I don't oh. know. I, I kind of, I'm sorry. But you oh, gotta okay. watch it's it okay. to hate it though. That's true. No, I have to understand it. it. No, 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 yeah. All right. So anyway, um, one thing that I noticed about your works is that you, talk about like marine life like I know like Lisa ends up going to like marine biology and stuff oh, like that oh yeah that's so, like, a good point what draws you to the ocean and like what I don't know just yeah my yeah um I don't know uh what draws me to that's yeah you know um <laughs> what draws me to the I you know I grew up adjacent to the ocean in Miami I do think uh, I was talking with somebody the other day about like I get mad about space exploration because I'm like can we go to the ocean first it's right there um, it's so much more, like, I don't know. I don't know what, I, I'm, I just feel a fascination with it and um, drawn to it in a way that has just always been there since I was very little and that it maybe verges even on the mystic. And so um, I leaned into that hardcore with this book, uh, I, with Make Your Home Among Strangers. Uh, the main character there is a marine biologist and that was like me, like like a healing fantasy. I was like, that's my other life that I never did. But like, it was never even like a possibility, I think for someone like me. But um, for m my reasons of like how my brain works, not, well, I mean, probably lots of reasons, but that's one of them. Um, I was always gonna find my way to writing in some way. But yeah, I just have a, I'm just pulled to the ocean in, uh, that's why like Nebraska, I was like, I, I gotta get the fuck out of here because <laughs> so far you couldn't go farther <laughs> from the ocean yeah they either direction um yeah thank you for that question and for noticing that across books 
While we queue up our next question, Melissa, have you seen Scarface? Yeah. You have? Okay, so. Yes, I've seen okay. it. Okay, yeah. all right, we've all seen Scarface. I will watch it again. Oh, you yeah? really yeah. don't have to watch it to get the book. I, I, just... I mean, I think you have to watch it to understand my the rage issues and the rage with it <laughs> and how like easy it is to just take it in as action and like wildness, but then step back and be like, whoa, this is what we were peddling and pushing. And still are. And still are. You no, know, it still hasn't are changed. On TV. It has uh, not changed. Yeah, it hasn't changed. And like, I'm now a adapting this book for television, and I sort of see how these things have hap these things happen. You yeah. know, the kind of notes that happen, and you sort of see the creep, right? Like, they and, start to push. Yeah, and in some ways, I'm like, that's fine, because it's a different medium, and there are other like TV's got its own it's its own world and its own set of things about like. You know, you sort of you get to do what you do in the second se the second season of a show, but the first season really has to look a certain way. Like there's a, just it's a different culture, so it's fine. But um, I think with Scarface, I think what's weird about it is that like I always thought it was like a, a comedy because it's so absurd. Yeah. And then I would so meet people absurd. who thought, oh, this is this was this must be you grew up around this. You grew up in this life. I was like, one, I wasn't born yet when that movie <laughs> happened, and two, no, like it's not. But I mean, that was a reality for some folks in Miami. But it's more the idea of like. The casting of that film um, in you know is something that I mentioned in the novel and that the narrator talks about or explores at some length is that there are no uh, actual there's only like one actual Cuban in the movie. It's <laughs> the guy who plays Manolo, uh, who would change his name to Stephen Bauer at some point before that, and then married Melanie Griffith, and then there's just like, like a long digression about that in the <laughs> novel. Um, but yeah, I think it, we can talk a little bit about how different art forms we like right against them or towards them, and Scarface and Moby Dick for me were two that I just felt they were the same thing, honestly. Like, yeah. in a lot of ways, they're these, like, this wild performance that ends in someone's death. Um, I don't All know. the time. Yeah. It's like, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. We got carried away. We got oh, back yeah. to the questions. Hi. Um, you mentioned archive, and I think I'm interested in both of you talking about how I think there is still obviously like, what is a Latinx archive or a Latina archive, especially those of like Latinas. So I wanna ask how did this idea of an archive felt like it was limiting, but also at the same time, knowing that Latinx lives are just so different. And this is in many ways, your, your books are speaking of that difference of the many different lives how has expanding that archive, because that is what y'all are doing, how is that also liberating? Yeah, do you want to start? Like that? Or you don't have That's to. That's a beautiful question. Yeah, it is. That's a That's hard, hard question. I had, I was like, <laughs> for you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's a hard question because I don't, I don't know if I necessarily see myself in, in the moment of writing that I'm expanding anything um, except exploring really. Um, some human element and trying to build a connection with my characters, frankly. So as expansive as it may seem when, once the product is, once it's done, in the moment, I'm really just trying to connect deeper and in some ways unearth also things that perhaps I've put away. Um, you know, like I'll, just give you an example, like with my first novel, which is about you know an undocumented woman um, and uh, her immigration experience in New York City in the early '90s. You know, I wrote the whole thing, and then at the end, when I was talking to editors um, about the novel, I came to realize that I was actually it was part of the undocumented child in me was like fearful of being separated from her parents and from her siblings. Um, and I think that I didn't really realize that that's, the part of, that's part of what I was writing, sort of to address that in some way. Um, and I don't know if I would have necessarily gotten to that point um, had I not been a parent myself. Um, I think I would have probably, you know, uh, eventually, but I think that you know, any writer who tells you that their work is not autobiographical is, 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 is correct, but there's always little pieces of us that we leave and that we somehow weave into our work. Um, the fact that that maybe resonates with the larger audience um, and touches on the Latin experience, 
the Peruvian experience, the Cuban American experience, whatever that experience is, is just, it's, it's wonderful, but I certainly don't go into it thinking I'm gonna write into like the Peruvian or the Peruvian American experience with this book. Yeah, I think, I think it really moved around for me through the process. I think in the, in the, in the nuts and bolts of like writing, I wasn't thinking in those ways. But I will say that my sense of writing into an archive, or if we're using the word archive here, uh, some, like, is, this, is a synonym for canon, right? Um, it's a little bit why I wore this t-shirt tonight, right? Because that's how I, this is, Elena Miramontes was my professor. She's the person I credit with helping Aww. me be a writer, they just did this big thing at my alma mater last year, and they invited writers that she's like taught, she also taught Manuel Munoz, and so she brought us both back to give readings, which was incredible and such a humbling experience, but then they made us these t-shirts. Um, so when I think in terms of an archive or a canon, I, I do think of like Elena and making sure that it's something that could stand next to her books. Um, and that have not been necessarily like commercially successful, um, but are sort of like critically and culturally like touchstones, right? Um, Under the Feet of Jesus, Other Dogs Came With Them, those two novels are for me masterpieces and they're trying to really push what a novel can do in terms of its form. Like how much can a novel hold before it overflows into something else, right? Um, so I know I was thinking about that as I was, I was trying to like really punch up <laughs> with the book, right, and think, how do, I, how do I grow as a writer? How do I, uh, if I feel like I know how to tell a certain kind of story a certain kind of way, how do I do something completely different this time around? Um, and knowing that even just that experiment, that ambition is opening up that canon and opening up that archive for writers that, you know, are, or that are writing alongside me and that are gonna come after me. That was beautiful. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, who would like to close us out? Yeah. Hi, um, this question's for Janine. I wanted to ask, I mean, reading all your books, they're so richly Miami, they're so richly Cuban-American. How do you stay connected to home as years pass and living in Nebraska and now living in North Carolina? I mean, how do you stay connected other than looking at YouTube videos of the background <laughs> of the fair? Uh, I would say that, that those videos made me hate it. Uh, I was just like, oh, I'm glad I don't live there anymore. Uh, it was just so wild all the time. How do I stay connected? I think the act of writing is probably how I'm staying connected. I know with this book, I was trying, and I've said this a couple times, but I was trying to like get out, get it out once and for all. I was like, I don't want to write about Miami anymore. I, you know, as much as my work is so firmly grounded in that place, uh, this was for this book. I was like, it's not a setting; it's the it's the subject. I'm trying to actually like write about the place in a way to help me empty that well. Um, but the thing about a well in Miami is as soon as you get the water out, it just fills up with more water from underneath, right? So that's where, you know, in terms of the new projects or new things that are coming, um, there's just, I thought I really would get it all out of my system and that it would, but it, would, it just kept me, it sort of like submerged me back into it. Um, I think also Miami is a strange place where it's a city that's always changing and it's a city that never changes. You go back and it, it's, it, it feels instantly familiar. So I do feel very lucky that I grew up there Whenever I meet folks out in the world that grew up in Miami, there's like an immediate familiarity. I think it is just something about that place that um, unless you like actively hate it, you're always connected. Um, so I think in this book, I was like, oh, I'm just gonna pretend that that's what I'm doing. I'm like actively hating it to get rid of it. And it just didn't work. Uh, it didn't work as a strategy for that. Um, so we'll see what's next. But are you from Miami? Is that? Oh my God, where did you go to high school? You went to Hylia too? You went to Hylia High. Thoroughbreds. Yeah, yeah, okay. So the, oh yeah? Where'd you go to high school then? Oh, okay, okay. Miami, deep. Yeah. <laughs> we show up. We show up for each other. We I really do. It. We show up for each other. Are you from Hialeah too, sir? Oh, Kendall? Okay. I mean, <laughs> oh, okay, Hialeah High. So the, in all my work, I got this, I got this note from a copy editor, just to say this real quick, that they were like, so in all my work, it's a fake high school called Hylia Lakes High because I don't want to give and I don't want to give HML any credit, but I also like respect Hylia High. But also I'm like that sounds made up, like Hylia High to outsiders. They're like, oh, it sounds like Bayside from like Stay by the Bell. Um, but I went to American High, the which is like up on you know 57th up like the rivals are Carroll City and HML, and 
but American High, the name of it is like two on the nose, <laughs> right? Because it was founded in 1976, and it was like nobody there is like American. <laughs> like we're all from all over the place. I mean, I guess maybe naturalized citizens and things, but it was just a weird. It never. I didn't want to put the real high school. So Highly Lakes is. I am aware that it is not a real school, everyone, but it is an amalgam of HML, Highly High, and um, uh, an American. So basically, you went there. It's yours. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, no. I love that Miami is, is, is here. Um, my brother's in Miami, so my heart's there now. Uh, so shout out to Miami for that reason. <laughs> but thank you two so much for Shout for out doing to this. my kids who are watching. Yay, Sebastian hi, hi. <laughs> yes, we have folks joining us virtually. And we will be back here in April. Um, we'll be announcing soon. Um, I don't have exact yet, but save the date for, I think, is April 25th? 24, no, 25th. It was the 25th. I'm not, I'm not, we'll talk later, but it's the 20th, 25th. Uh, so try to save the day. We'll be announcing soon. Thank you, too, for coming. Thank, Thank you, you everyone, us. for Thank being here with us. Um, everyone. Our two amazing authors will be signing books outside. Um, as David mentioned, there are free copies over there. They also have free copies from the series earlier this year. I mean, last year. So... Feel free to grab them. Um, and again, thank you. Thank you to DCPL and thank you to po Politics and Prose, our booksellers. Um, we really appreciate you all. Thank you so much. Thank you.